Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to Norman Williams Public Library. I, I think you all know Les Bernard, I'm the programming librarian. And we appreciate you coming out on this somewhat <laughs> miserable evening. You wouldn't know it was going to be so awful today at 2 o'clock this afternoon because it was so gorgeous. But, um, we appreciate your participation, participation, I can't say it again, and your generous donations to the library. Um, while masks are no longer required, we encourage their use indoors so we can all stay as healthy as possible. A quick reminder to silence your devices and other distracting things. And um, the format tonight's going to be pretty straightforward. I'm going to give a brief introduction and then our guest will have the floor to talk about his books and there will be time for a question and answer. So we are pleased to welcome Geza Chatralier back to the library. Geza, sorry. Um, he escaped from Budapest, as you may all know, um, and moved to Toronto with his family in the mid-1950s during the Hungarian Revolution. He attended Harvard University, Oxford University, and the London School of Economics and Politics, earning various degrees in the human sciences. Professionally, Geza has worked in government, international organizations, finance, and environmental entrepreneurship around the globe. Unrelated to writing or finance, the point of interest is that he represented Canada, Canada um, as a fencer in the 1976 Olympic Games of Montreal, which I trust made it into at least one of your books. Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> and then it's the French of it. Yeah. This evening we're celebrating the publication of the latest of his 15 books, which include thrillers, memoirs, poetry, short stories, now short stories, and children's books. The Abyss is a collection of poetry that explores the wonder of nature and laments our role in its destruction. And his first short story collection, Mind Spins, which happens to be right here, um, brings together tales based on remembered dreams. Please join me in welcoming Geza to the podium. Good evening. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Liza. Thank you for organizing this uh, event, on, especially on such a terrible night. Uh, and thanks to the Norman Williams Public Library for hosting it, and to all of you for coming here. It's a real, a real treat for me to have such a large audience on such a terrible night <laughs> of good friends. Um, today, as uh, Liza mentioned, I would like to present my two latest published books. One, my first and only short story, story collection, which you mentioned, and the other, my fifth poetry collection, The Abyss, Poems for Our World. So I'll start with the My Spins, and I think you will enjoy this book, uh, as it is a rather eclectic uh, collection of stories. One of the things I'm trying to do in this little volume is to explore how we create narrative. And I try to do this by contrasting how the mind spins in its dreaming or semi-conscious state, with how it does so when trying to tell a story in a fully conscious state. And this all started some years ago, when I became quite intrigued by the propensity of the mind to weave narrative plots when asleep. As he dreams and affect as stories, the mind spins, incorporating components from conscious life with some strange, fantastical elements we may have encountered early in our li earlier in our lives, or even in our childhood, and taking unexpected twists and turns, often to resolve issues from daily life. But the end result is a story, however weird. I started exploring this by writing down some of my dreams immediately after waking, trying to capture as much of the storyline and with the characters as possible. <coughs> Then at a later date, I would polish the best of these and turn them into short stories. And these make up the second half of the book. There are seven such dream stories, some from quite a few years back and some more recent. <clears throat> I then thought of putting these together in one volume with stories written in a fully, fully conscious state, some of which were triggered by personal experiences, such as walking past a painted school bus on the block near our place in Barnard, or a strange phone message from my brother about my, our father telling him that I uh, promised to bring him down to Vermont uh, from Toronto 
one Christmas in the sidecar of a motorcycle. And needless to say, I, I don't have a motorcycle in every day, and certainly not one with the sidecar. And I would not drive it on the interstate uh, in the middle of winter with my uh, aging father beside me. So some other stories were inspired by critical social issues, such as immigration, the treatment of veterans, and human trafficking. So I will read one of the more recent dream stories from the book, one that brings together some key elements in my life and weaves them into what is a somewhat crazy story. This is the second last entry in the book, and it's called The Poet and the Fencing Man. So that there's a fencing coming into the story. And I think you will see what I mean. So the important elements in my life that are woven into this story are, of course, my darling wife, Marcia, who's here with us. Good, fine and food, good, good wine and food, which as a European uh, has, has always been a passion for me. Fencing, the sport uh, that I pursued uh, through school and beyond the Olympics in 1976. And poetry, which I've written just about my entire life. But the way that these and other elements all come together and distorted, I think you will agree, is strange and in some ways quite funny. So here it is, the poet and the fencing bag. If you're up, up to listening to a short story, here we go. The lecture was finally about to start. The presenter, a slim, balding man with glasses, dressed in a tan suit, jean shirt, and loosened checkered red tie, approached the projector with his soft slides. I must say, in this day and age, I found this all somewhat old-fashioned. The man fumbled as he put the transparencies in the tray and dropped several. Then, once he had gathered them all again in a pile, he had to squint toward the light through each one to make sure he put them back in the right order. This all took time, especially as his hands shook like my father's did from Parkinson's, and the audience fidgeted anxiously, adding ambient noise to the low, annoying hum of the projector. The lecturer finally turned around to face the audience, then adjusted his tie and cleared his throat with a loud croak to settle the crowd. He introduced himself as Michel Bédard from Bédard Wineries, a Bordeaux-based conglomerate that owned vineyards all over the world. Marcia and I sat near the middle, over on the right-hand side, only 20 rows back, with Bédard's strong French accent, as well as the spectators' continued rustling, made him hard to understand. A few minutes into the slideshow, after Bedar told us that the eponymous family company owned 69 wineries around the world, including some in unlikely places such as Japan, Uruguay, and Vermont, I felt Mar Marcia's hand gently brush my elbow. Here's a, I don't feel so well, she said in a feeble voice. And when I expressed no more sympathy than, and uh, I'm sorry, as I tried to add Bedar's introduction to other wine vineyards in France, Marcia continued. I think I'd like to go. I finally looked over at her and saw that she was indeed looking rather pale, with a green-gray mean to match her jacket. I realized I would have to forego this wine presentation, even though it was one that I'd been anticipating before last. Okay, the air inside. Let's cuddle out to the sun. Marcia stood up and disturbing her startled neighbor, who eventually overcame his annoyance and vain to pull his knees aside. We piled past several quietly fuming wine aficionados. When we made it over to the side, I grasped her elbow to make sure she wouldn't fall and hurt herself, but also so we wouldn't become more respectable. I was painfully aware by the time we finally exited to one of the side doors that the piercing eyes of the audience were on us instead of Michel Bédard. Out in the lobby, as I desperately weighed our options, I took Marsha over to one of the comfortable armchairs. We had already checked out of our room that morning, and I'd overheard the receptionist say that the hotel was overbooked for the upcoming holiday weekend. Staying another night to let Marsha rest wasn't an option. In any case, I decided that the first step was to get her to a doctor as soon as possible. I stood in line at the concierge desk, thinking they might be able to suggest a nearby hospital or doctor's office, meanwhile multitasking as I anxiously looked over at Marsha. I searched for doctors on my iPhone, and fretted about having missed the lecture. Once I finally got to the front of the line, which took a good 10 minutes, much to my chagrin, the attendant wrote down the name and address of the clinic nearby, assuring that someone would be able to see us there. 
I asked him to get our bags from the store and I called a car for us. He pointed me to the cab stand outside, so I picked him the fire. Then, slinging my rucksack over one shoulder and the fencing bag over the other, I started to roll the two-wheeled suitcases toward where I had left Marsha. Much to my surprise, I saw that she was gone. Frantically, I looked around and finally perceived her through the large glass window standing up the driveway, looking forlornly back at me as she tried to get a taxi. I knew, though, from the concierge that none would stop there. The cabs only picked up passengers down the hill. I waved to Marsha, indicating for her to follow me, and proceeded balancing all the bags to where the concierge had told me the taxis made their pickup. She seemed to have gotten the message, but still I was extremely annoyed when we missed the first car. The next one stopped, and I opened the door for my ailing wife, then went around the back to put the bags in the trunk. That proved to be a real struggle, mainly because the fencing bag was long and such an odd shape that I was irritated that the driver just popped the boot open and didn't bother to give me a hand. I resolved not to give him much of a tip. As the chauffeur drove off, he started talking and told me he'd immigrated from Poland several years earlier and that in his spare time, he was a poet. When I told him that I wrote poetry as well, driver Lawrence invited me back to his place to show me some of his work. I was delighted, since I thought it would certainly be better than waiting in the doctor's office, so we dropped Marsha off. Just in case she needed to be picked up earlier than we planned to return, he gave her his phone number and address. At his two-story bungalow, Lawrence insisted on taking the bags inside in case he was suddenly called away for another ride. He sat me down in the kitchen, fetched two beers from the fridge, Kirin's, my favorite since my days in Japan, and handed me a dog-eared purple spiral notebook with poems written across the cover page in bold black letters. As I read the first verse, my concentration was interrupted by the rasping voice of a woman with what did not sound very much like a Polish accent yelling from upstairs, Larry, is that you? My new friend Lawrence, or Larry, shouted back, Yes, Viv! That didn't sound like a Polish name either. Who's that with you, Billy? Make sure you're offering something to eat. The shrill instruction floated toward us from somewhere in the ether. Larry, you know there's some sauerkraut in the fridge. Sure thing, Liz. Larry bellowed as he rolled his eyes for my benefit. And Larry, be on the lookout for the children. They might show up, came the next directive down the stairs from Viv. In response, I heard Larry mutter under his breath, Oh God, that woman. I was momentarily puzzled by the mention of children, but then got back to the little volume of verse, thinking after the first poem that in spite of being a browbeaten husband, Larry was an amazing bard. Honking from outside interrupted my critical thinking. Could that be Marsha already? I jumped up and eagerly followed my host. Larry opened the door as a taxi came to a sudden stop in front of the house. An old woman with white hair jacked up into a bun rolled down the rear window and peered through six thick spectacles. Is this 17 Porter Guy Street? Larry shouted, not on your life, you old goofball. You got the wrong address. He dismissed her with a raucous laugh. He waved me to a small table and two folding chairs on the little stone patio in front of the house. Why don't we just sit here? It's really pleasant outside. I sat on one of the rickety chairs worried that it might break, while Larry brought out the book of poems and two mortgages. We sipped our curians in silence until, just as I was reading the fourth poem, I was interrupted by another screeching of tires. Looking up from the booklet, I saw that a white van had pulled up half on the sidewalk, half off. The door on the far side slammed, and the blonde driver, wearing an orange uniform with rodent kill in cursive white letters on the back, appeared from behind the van. Hey, the exterminator greeted us without glancing in our direction. Was he Danish, I wondered? Not that it mattered. He opened the back doors, pulled out two white, nearly translucent, plastic faceless dolls, and brought them over to Larry and me. Here are your babies, my friend. He screwed the head of one of these dolls off and handed it to me. No thanks, I recalled in disgust. It's not mine. When he tried to give the doll's head to Larry, he also said, Nope, not my baby either. The van driver shrugged. Okay then, no skin off my back, and proceeded to have the white doll body parts back, heave, heave the white doll body parts back into the van. I'll be off then. He slammed the doors and drove off in the house. 
Doing all this commotion in the background, I vaguely heard this strident voice again, anxiously asking, Larry, what's happening down there? What are you and Bill getting up to? No answer came, she continued. Did you have the sauerkraut? You know, Billy always asked for that. I was pleased, though, that my friend ignored her, even though I could see the buildup of the noise in his mouth. I went back to the patio table again and sat down to read the poetry notebook while Larry sauntered inside to replenish our hearing. I secretly hoped he would offer me some of the sauerkraut, since it would go, it would go well with the beer. Maybe a Polish kielbasa, too. I could not help that my stomach was dirty. The more I delved into the taxi driver's poetry, the more I thought, man, this guy's really good. Better than any other living poet I've read. Right up there with T.S. Eliot, Robert Lowell, and all those greats. Why isn't he published? He should be the next poet laureate of this guy. I was about three quarters of the way through the little volume when another car screeched around the corner and came to a halt right in front of where I was sitting. When I saw Marsha in the driver's seat of the white Morris Mini Minor classic convertible, I jumped up to greet her with great delight. Wow, dear, where did you get the wheels? Pretty classy stuff. The doctor lent this car to me, but I ignored her answer as I immediately knew we had a huge problem on our hands. <clears throat> For sure, we wouldn't be able to get all the bags into this beautiful vehicle. <clears throat> How are, we, how are we going to do this, Marsha? I kept my voice calm, <coughs> even though I felt my blood pressure skyrocket. The fencing back is the problem. There's simply no room for it. Yeah, I guess you're right. I didn't think of that. No point in getting angry, I told myself. There had to be a solution. Larry, could I get you to send the back to me? No way, Jose, he shook his head. I ain't in the shipping business. What do you take me for, dude? UPS, FedEx? Would you like to buy it, then, with everything inside? What the fuck for? It's of no use to me. I don't fence, he laughed loudly. Nor does Bid. We're not the three musketeers. I'll give you a really good price, I tried to bargain with him. But I was getting a little annoyed with my supposed new poet, Amigo. I didn't like the language he was using, and he maybe he wasn't as good a friend as I thought. I even wondered whether he'd written those wonderful poems. Indeed, how could he have if he talked like that? As we stood around the mini, trying to figure out a way out of this predicament, several teenage boys, some with fags hanging out of their mouths, gathered around. One of them, wanting to be of help, picked up the offending bag and placed it across the convertible's folded roof and said, why don't you just put it here, like that? No, no, I pulled the bag away. We won't be able to close the top. Oh, sorry, he backed off and rejoined his friends. I had yet another idea. Would you guys like to buy the fencing bag with all the equipment inside? I addressed the group. There are four MAs, six extra blades, some other FA parts, three body cords, and some other junk in there. Really valuable stuff. The boys looked at each other. The one who seemed this oldest threw the cigarette butt on the asphalt and stepped on it. No thanks. We have better uses for our money. Laughing yet. Plus, the idiot, we don't fence. No one here does. Well, do you want to try and sell the bag and everything in it for me? I threw out my last attempt. I'll make you a deal. You can have half the money from any sale. Just send me a check for the other half once you get rid of all the stuff. No, man, we're not in the business of trafficking weird equipment. And I told you, asshole, no one around here does that stupid sport. We play hockey or do track. I was getting very annoyed and frustrated and also worried now that we would miss our flight. So raising my voice, I yelled to the large crowd that had assembled. Okay, I'm going to leave this fencing back here on the side of the road, and you all can do whatever you want with it. We have a plane to catch. Goodbye. We took off in the meeting, Marsh and I, driving like a fiend. I never saw my fencing bag again, nor my questionable friend, Larry, and Viv, his annoying wife, with a piercing voice. But I did wonder lingeringly about the sauerkraut and the kielbasa. Many years later, while browsing in a bookstore, I picked up a little purple book. A book of poetry with poems written across the cover in bold black letters. Underneath, in smaller cursive characters, was the name of the poet, Vivian Ellsworth. Inside were the wonderful poems I'd read that fateful day, when I became separated forever from my family. It was Viv, then, who should be the next poet laureate. 
And with a name like that, I doubted that either had ever eaten Polish kielbasa. <laughs> like the tears go down over all of their faces. It's different turns and twists. Some of the other green stories are considerably weird and eat with, with fantastical creatures, actions, etc. And we need a temporal and spatial horizon. But that, that is part of the point. In the dream state, we are not constrained by the boundaries of reality. Although, as we know, dreams do draw on reality to construct their narratives. And there's maybe some resemblance in these dream stories to uh, science fiction. But dream, dreams are even less tied to the logic demanded by waking fiction of creating a coherent plot and believable characters. The dream storyline often jumps around in time and space with less rationale than science fiction. I think you will understand what I'm getting at if you venture to read several more of the stories in the book. As an aside, my daughter Alexandra, who's a psychologist, found the stories entertaining and interesting, but she declined to suffer further psychoanalyze <laughs> weird father. Nevertheless, I'd be interested in the comments you have. Uh, but before I leave the mind spins, I'd like to highlight one other story, uh, the very first one in the book, which was written in the conscious state. And I wrote this as a standalone tale, but have subsequently decided to use a version, a version of it as the lead-in chapter for my next book, uh, a murder mystery novel. I'm currently working on, which will be set here in Vermont. And this is the first book I'm, I've written that will be set in Vermont, so I'm quite excited. And, and the working title is The Purple School Bus Murders. I hope to get it up by the end of the year. So I will leave the mind spins behind for now and uh, turn briefly to the abyss. Uh, the poems in this collection were mostly written over the last three or four years for maximum. So during COVID and Trump times, and many of the poems reflect uh, some of the trauma we all encountered during these years. Still more delve into my concern for the environment, what we are doing to the world around us, to other species, and to ourselves. You will also see in this filled volume uh, my fascination with haiku. I love the conciseness, the brevity inherent in this Japanese form. The imperative being to convey something meaningful, mostly about the natural world or how we feel about it, in 17 syllables. Although some haiku do depart from this. My captivation with this poetic form goes back to the year I spent in Japan in 1969 to 70, uh, when I worked at the World's Fair Expo 7 in Osaka. And uh, in the lead up to it, we had to learn Japanese, some Japanese, and uh, we were exposed uh, to Japanese culture. I will start with a few haiku from the volume, but just uh, at, before I do that, I'd just, just like to mention that normally haiku don't have titles, but because I put them in uh, with other longer poems in the same volume, I always use a, uh, <coughs> a phrase from it, a couple of words, or the, the first line to identify. So they're short, so they won't take long, uh, but I'll read a few of them. Um, and the first one. The pond beckons me. The pond beckons me. Crayfish nibble on my toes. My friends, the frogs, crow. So these are just three lines and 17 syllables. Now, stardust from heaven. Lighting my way home. Fireflies float among the trees. Stardust from heaven. Another night sky one Milky Way. Along the night sky, I follow the Milky Way through the universe. Here's one we've experienced recently, uh, right here in Vermont, wet snow. The program red rain, the blobs of wet snow dance. Nature changed its mind. Another, another winter one, the wail of the wind. The wail of the wind wafting through winter trees, the woodwinds weeping. One uh, called Angry Clouds. 
angry clouds tangle to the music of the frogs, those thundering gods. And one uh, called those stars. No stars, cloudy night, the moon's tremolo portends, calamity looms. And just one, one more since we were talking about the mind, the mind spins, and this encapsulates it all, the spinning mind. The inspired mind spins a thought into a story, or at night, a dream. And now for some longer poems, if you'll bear with me. This is the first two are from the first part of the volume. The first part is called The Beautiful World. And the first poem I'll read from that is called My Friend, the Crescent Moon. <clears throat> My friend, the crescent moon, a sliver of silver in the twilight heavens. The lighthouse in the, in the sky that guides and comforts me through this threatening night enveloping the world. When will day come again? I've written quite a few poems about different uh, species, I mean the animal species, and I call them my like beastie poems, but I use one of them. <clears throat> it's called The Spider's Web. A spider spins a spool of spit, that ever so fine filament, into a rough, filigree web. A death trap for wayfaring flies and other flying bugs and beasts that it will munch on. Only the arachnid can scoot with its long legs and hang those threads to get at its perishing prey. Do not destroy its perfect mesh, this de delicate but sturdy snare that both destroys and sustains life. And now we we'll go to the second part of the book, and it's called Our Pleasures, the first one dedicated to my wife, it's called The Dying Fire. The faint flame from the dying fire flickers just enough with the breeze to light up your eyes in the night. They tell me that you still love me, a glance that reassures, comforts. The hint, the hint of a beguiling smile, a whiff of your floral fragrance, here snuggling next to my body, fill my heart with such happiness. The fire dies, our love does not. This one with a slightly different flavor to it, but uh, it's, uh, is it? it's called Still Lusting. It's again about a dream. A squirming sea of flesh and skin covered with tiny beads of sweat, of tussled hair, the odd eyeball roving across the horizon. An orgy of orgasmic thrills seems to await my throbbing self. I strip naked and dive lustful into the vortex of this dream, then wait beside you, still lusting, but this time only after you. The next one, we're back to sort of poems about the mind. About, but the wakeful mind is called. The wakeful mind at night in bed stresses and magnifies issues left over from the day's struggles, weaves them into dreams too vivid for those terrifying nightmares with metamorphosed, haunting characters from past and present, who bring a strange resolution or derail the plot before death as the mind wakes to face the light. The next one is a little bit about how I write poetry or how poems that have come to me. It's called My Poems Grow Like a Tree. My poems grow like a tree. Ideas germinate in the mind's fertile soil. Tonal words with meaning emerge, and like fresh shoots sprout into rhythmic lines. New thoughts, new directions spread their roots, their tendrils. Lo, a metaphor forms, a freshly budding bough, and an image blossoms like a flagrant flower. Alliterations buzz like summer bumblebees in my ecstatic ear, a perfected picture with transcendent music, 
painted with few words. And now we'll move on to part three in the book, which is how we, and how we destroy it all. So the first poem I'll read here is called Swirls of Plastic Swim in the Seas. Swirls of plastic swim in the seas, deathly fodder for fish, seabirds, turtles, even dolphins and whales, and ultimately ourselves. We throw out our used plastic bags, but then end up ingesting them, killing many living beings unwittingly along the way. Our profligate stupidity will result in our extinction. Uh, again, a wintry one. Snowflakes dance a wild flamingo. Snowflakes dance a wild flamingo, blustered by the raging blizzard, hither and thither all around. Winds howl shrieking through window cracks. Cold seeps into and through our bones, and we shiver under blankets, freezing and in trepidation of the unearthly destruction of climate change, sure to follow and wash away this world of ours. There was a similar scene, theme called Satanic Walls. <clears throat> satanic walls cavort on my mother, gnaw at her flesh, drink of her blood, hoofs prancing wildly on Gaia. The witch's cauldron of human waste, the debris of a warmed up world, it empties on her alien corpus. Can we still save our Mother Earth, or will she perish? Mankind. One called I Weep with the Rain. Appropriate for tonight, I guess. I weep with the rain for the world we use, for the ancient forests our wildfires burn, the grasslands we turn to Syrian desert, the seas filled with plastic and overfish. The smoggy, smoky air we now must breathe. For my grandchildren, how will they survive? And now from the last part of the book, which is called I Plead for Humanity. Send an SOS out into space. Send an SOS out into space. There might be intelligent life out there in this vast universe. Please come save us, you aliens. Please save our worthwhile creations, our Mona Lisa and Hamlet, Bach's sublime solo cello suites, our scanned scientific knowledge, which no doubt just fails beside yours. Alien friends, have pity on us, miserable human beings, this fallible living species that has destroyed its planet. Please come save us, you aliens. <clears throat> a couple more, if you'll bear with me. The next one I wrote in, uh, right after the, 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 the George Floyd murder. It's called Lay Down Your Arms, Brother. Lay down your arms, brother. Come here and embrace me. Now figuratively, while COVID still plays us. Why all this enmity? Why do you want to shoot me? What did I do to you? We are all made equal. I have hands, feet like you, eyes, nose, mouth, ears, and hair. Only my skin color is a little darker. Do not pull the trigger. Let us work together to make this land better, to create a country that welcomes all mankind. And then one last one, which I wrote. Uh, at the height of the pandemic. It's called Homo Post Coronavirus. We are all premature corpses. Death masks now cover our faces as we walk around like zombies, not touching, feeling, or hugging our fellow ghost like creatures. We quake with the frigid frisson of fear that we might just crumble into viral dust with the next breath. 
At night, we return to our tombs of anxiety and terror and wake to morbid statistics. Will there be at least one Adam and one Eve who survive this plague to spawn a new kind of pain? One who will treat this world better, not destroy its fellow species, the land, sea, and air all around, a wiser and kinder human, homo post-coronavirus. So as you see, my poetry tends to be short, they're short poems. And that's again something I learned from uh, Haiku. For me, poetry, unless we're talking about narrative poetry, such as the Odyssey or the Iliad, need not be verbose to get uh, its message across. So in any case, I've, I hope I've uh, given you an introduction to these little volumes. They are both available at the library here. They have all, all 15 of my books. I'm, I'm honored by that. And also at the Charles Danforth Library in, in Barnard. <coughs> the Yankee Bookshop has them. And of course, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other online book sites. I also have a few copies uh, here that I'm happy to sign if anybody wishes. Uh, and uh, anyways, thank you for listening. And I'm happy to take questions and comments. <laughs> Maybe. Um, <clears throat> your poems raise a lot of questions. Uh, do you have answers? No. <laughs> <laughs> poems for me are, ex are exactly that. They're questions. Yeah. They, they, uh, and many of them are, uh, are framed as questions. And, uh, and some of the earlier poetry I, I also I wrote were also sort of fragments. So they were just a thought that I turn into a poem, poem without any solutions, any resolution. And that's where dreams, dreams come in. That dreaming sort of resolves some things here and there. Yeah. I mean, not necessarily perfectly, but uh, dreams are uh, the way of, for the mind to resolve issues that crop up in the day. <coughs> and you always feel a little better after the anxieties of the night when you wake up and see, see some solutions. Anybody else? Yes. I, I love your short story. It was so entertaining. And is it based at all in fact? I mean, how is Marsha so smart to get the car? <laughs> was she really? It's a dream. <laughs> it's a dream. I mean, there, there are really elements of fact, fact. With great details. A dream with great details. Yeah. Well, that's that's what dreams are. I mean, and, uh, what, what, what was, uh, I was lucky that I was able to remember. That's, I mean, the, 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 I only have seven dreams in, in this book, because the others I didn't find, that I wrote down, I didn't find them. That's a co uh, this cohesive story, because I hadn't remembered many of the parts, I just remembered fragments of it. Um, but this one I rem remembered more or less in its totality. It's, it starts, it's, I, I find it starts out a little slowly, but, but that's how dreams work. Sometimes it takes a, a while for the dream to get into sort of the gist of the story, and it more, uh, convoluted elements. Uh, so uh, to me that is interesting. But yes, I mean, uh, we, uh, uh, I've been to conferences like that, not necessarily one. It was just great that you rescued Barsha, took her to the hospital, and that she rescued you with the super yes. sports star. <laughs> and the way you dropped her off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Going on the well, I'm I'm so excited by the <laughs> Polish poet. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I mean, that, that would never happen to have a taxi driver. She was a, a, an accomplished poet. And, um, never. Don't talk about never. it. Yeah. Uh, and the fa fencing bag is just an accessory which creates huge problems. Uh, yeah. It seems to me that the height of fiction would be for a fencer to beat his bag of swords. <laughs> I mean, that's an impossible dream. <laughs> She may write in haiku is probably the ultimate in writing poetry. I think so, yeah. It, it's, it's much to me like, like a short story. So much has to go into every single word. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're essentially, I mean, you're, it's, you're painting with words. You're painting a, a, an image with words, capturing it in, in, <coughs> or 
you're feeling often for both. But every, every word has to be there. Yeah. There can be yeah. no yeah. busyness, right. no right. Right. You know, everything has right. to be. It can be for both. Yeah. Yeah. So I think to be really good at it, which I think you are, is is you know, really an amazing feat. Yeah, I know I, I love haiku. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Haiku me. <laughs> kind of it's that kind of poem. Yeah. Um, regarding writing down your dreams, did you find that the more you wrote your dreams, the more you remembered? Um, someone who I guess writes based on a lot of dreams he had said that it's sort of like a skill. You you don't realize how much you're dreaming, some people don't realize they're dreaming, right. but he would sleep with paper and pencil, and you know, the second he stirred, many of us try to get back to sleep, yeah. but he would yeah. grab his he pencil himself. and try to remember right. what exactly yeah. he was yeah. um, That's what I did about. for a while yeah. in my life. I was recording your dreams. And then sometimes you'd be able to go back and do it, which is amazing too, mm -hmm. or else something else comes up. Uh, yeah, so it, you do get better with pain. I, I've relinquished that now, I don't do that anymore. But uh, for a while I did that. And that's where certainly the early uh, dream stories come from that era. I think only the two, the two, two last ones. Thank you everyone for coming. We look forward to your next book. We <laughs> look forward to it. That'll be Vermont. Vermont. <laughs> school bus. Well, well, it's the first summer to have a virtual school bus. This is, this, uh, this is the back in front of the So is it right then? So do you know that you know how you want to change? Do you, do you have that in your mind? Uh, sometimes I have sort of in my for my life, some of my pillars I did, but for this book, no. It's just taking life. It's just book. taking yeah. life. You don't know how it's going to No, no, I, I, I had not anticipated the direction it's taken at all. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Just bit by bit, I think maybe new characters get introduced if you need them, and you do uh, new events, and they take you in a different way. It's, it's a fascinating process, I think. Yeah, it's more fun. That's part of it. So, I keep writing. I find it uh, psychologically fascinating. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out.